hi. Um, I don't know if a lot of you know who I am just because um, I haven't we haven't really been in person in a while, but I graduated last year from the BSLA program. Um, and uh, I'm currently a landscape designer in Saratoga Springs, New York, which is about two hours from here, so not too far. Um, about me, um, so I was always interested in nature, sustainability, and art and design as a kid. So that kind of is what brought me to landscape architecture. So um, what led me to my current company, I really wanted to work for a smaller company that had like a broader scale of work, like doing all sorts of design work. And I was also really interested in working for a company that had um, female landscape architects, because as you look to um, apply for jobs, it's kind of hard to find sometimes. So um, my company is woman owned, and out of our nine employees, um, seven are women, which is like really cool. Um, so from my work experience, I hadn't, um, I started my job pretty recently, about four months ago, and then before that, I was working as a community garden intern in Cambridge, and then I also was a graphic design intern at a nonprofit for a little bit as well. Um, so I guess my advice for like my upcoming graduates would be like, really just don't worry about what anyone else is doing. Like, it was, I know it's like really easy to say that than to, th to actually believe it, but like, if you don't have a job when you graduate, it's okay. Like, take that time to like do whatever you want. Like, over the summer, I didn't have a job when I graduated, and I went on this like awesome like 30 day road trip, and it was like the best time ever. Like, I, I'm so glad I did that, and I don't know, I would really recommend not starting to work right away just because like you've been a student for like however long you've been a student and like that's all you know. So like just do whatever you want and like have fun. <laughs> so um, yeah, my advice to like all the students in the department would definitely be like pay attention in your non-studio classes because that's what's <laughs> actually important. <laughs> like as much as studios are like when you graduate and you have a job, like what you're going to be doing is like site engineering, plant design, like you're not really making a lot of like big projects. So like I know it's really hard to like not put studio above everything else, but try not to do that. Um, and then I would also like really recommend not staying all night here. Like look coming like looking back it was so stupid that like I stayed here all the <laughs> like I remember being here with Josh like we had a studio presentation at like 11 and we were here till 9 a.m. like why did we do that <laughs> um so like I rec I definitely think it's kind of like looking back it's like how much better was that five hours of work probably not that much um and then I would say um definitely like explore the area and try to like get out and like look at different inspirations like there's a lot of pretty things like within a half hour of UMass so like definitely try and do that and then if you can like I highly recommend studying abroad I was able to do that for like two months because of COVID but like it was super fun to like learn landscape architecture in a different school in a different environment and then also definitely don't make this your life like if you want to you totally can like that's like super cool if you're really passionate about it but like have other interests and hobbies and like don't stay here like 25 hour extra hours a week like do other things like take classes outside of the department like hang out with friends like it's kind of hard to say that now, but like looking back, that was something that I definitely did that I would have done differently. And then, so I guess that's kind of it. But if you have any questions or comments, you can like email me or talk to me afterwards. But yeah. <laughs>
So like many people here, I had a very crooked path to landscape architecture. Um, I didn't even know what it was until the tail end of my undergraduate degree at Delaware, where I was in plant science and plant pathology. Very much a microbio lab-based um, program. And from there, I briefly started a different graduate program in a different field. Luckily realized it wasn't for me, left, sort of floated around for a little bit. I worked as a nurseryman back in Virginia where I grew up. Then I moved up to Boston and worked as a horticulturalist and a foreman before coming back to school here and completing my MLA. And since graduating, I've been working as a designer with Matthew Cunningham Landscape Architecture. The reason why this is important to me is because I believe more than many other fields, landscape architects are generalists. Uh, your day-to-day -day work involves a ridiculous number of fields, and your week-to-week -week and month-to-month -month work, you could literally find yourself working with anything, um, whether it's related fields like planning, zoning, um, construction, to things much further afield. Uh, you really act as a synthesizer of information and a team leader in this position. And that means it's very useful to have a wide background and to um, actually know a little bit of a lot of things instead of only a lot of one thing. And so in that vein, I'd encourage all of you while you're here to pursue your interests. Most people didn't come here simply because they like landscape architecture. They came here through another interest. For me, that was ecology. Uh, while studying plant science and plant pathology, I became very interested in ecology, um, conservation, biology, and how that relates to the environments people inhabit. And there is the connection that eventually led me to more to the environments people inhabit side and how are those are made, who designs them. Um, but I didn't let go of that original interest while I was here. And I spent two years on the side working on a research project looking at the establishment of meadow plant communities along roadsides. Uh, very uh, heavy and relying on my previous experience and more traditional sciences, lab-based uh, field studies, and covering everything from, uh, from specking compost and particle size distributions all the way to thinking about population genetics and how the source of your seed influences not just the planting but the wild plant populations around it. Uh, similar to a key piece of advice Hannah gave, uh, I'd encourage you to diversify what you spend time on while you're here. Obviously, you're here. Uh, many of you are full-time. Some are part-time students. That is going to be the majority or maybe even the vast majority of your time, but it definitely should not be all of your time. This was really important for me when we switched to remote learning. Uh, when was that? It's such a time warp with COVID. Back in 2019, 2020, 2020, spring of 2020. Uh, that was a rough semester, to say the least. <laughs> About halfway through the program, you're just starting to level off on the learning curve of like the million new softwares uh, you had never touched before. Just starting to get comfortable, and then it just completely switches up. And having a uh, hobby, or in this case, a business, a soap business that my then fiance started and I was heavily involved in, was really important for me to fall back on when school was not bringing me the joy it usually did. Uh, and, and slightly shifting the amount of time I spent on one versus the other to a little more heavily weigh on the other non-school thing really helped me get through that semester. Additionally, it was another interest of mine. I've always been interested in business and finance, and this was a way to express that and get experience with it. And it almost led to my first job, not at Matthew Cunningham, but at um, Wagner and Hodgson. And it's because of this diverse interest that I almost got it. It's what <laughs> the things I was involved in that were outside of landscape architecture are what made me stand out. Because everyone else applying for that position has a experience, many experiences in landscape architecture. Not many of them are involved in a small soap company, which I then translated into uh, perhaps a, a deeper understanding than others in that same position of the business side of the studio. Again, so these interests, it's not just for your own mental health, it's not just to cultivate the skills, but it's actually very important in the hiring process. These are the things that make you unique, so you should pursue them. 
And on that end, I would, in my opinion, look for a firm that values a broad skill set, that values you being a generalist. Uh, I've heard of the occasional story, stories of someone who finds a firm, maybe even a very prestigious firm, but sort of gets shoeholed. Um, you know, they realize you're good at one thing coming in the gate, and they just keep giving you more and more of it. And while that's, it's good to be recognized as an expert of a skill, it's not good to be shoeboxed like that because that really stunts your growth as a professional. You want to constantly be asked to try to do new things. Um, and in this instance, uh, these are some pictures from a dry laid stone workshop I got to attend uh, with encouragement from Matthew Cunningham this past fall run by the Stone Trust up in New Hampshire. Did not have to send me there. I'm not building <laughs> with my own hands, or even usually detailing freestanding stone walls. Usually it's all stone veneer. But it was an interest of mine, and this is a firm that really values your interests and encourages you to pursue them. So I'd keep that in mind as you end, come to the end of your uh, time in school and start to look abroad for employment. And that's, that's really what I've got. Uh, very happy to be here. Very happy to talk with a lot of you during the panel and afterwards. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. It feels great to be back. Uh, my name is Rachel Newman. I graduated uh, last spring, 21. Um, I'm working at Andover Landscape now since graduation. I've been a fine gardening foreman there and now a designer in the winter. So I thought it was a good idea to express what I've been doing through each season. I think in a landscape industry, it's really an important thing to kind of get an aspect of what every season is like and how that affects our work. So in spring, I started doing a lot of container plantings. I jumped right into a leadership role of the fine gardening foreman, and that came with a lot of challenges and accomplishments. Um, leadership involved working with a lot of really cool interns, getting to know their passions as I was learning my own. And fine gardening, just honing in on really delving into horticulture that I learned at UMass and being able to, you know, actually get to work with my hands. So then summer comes along and I delve a little bit more into construction and planting design. Um, you know, landscape architecture is not just, you know, designing something. A lot goes into it and I feel really thankful that I've been a part of each aspect of that field, whether it's laying sod or maintenance or even the design side of things. Um, I thought it was very useful to kind of see these designs in action in all different seasons, like layering of plants and how they change within each season. So the fall comes to see them start blooming. Um, I, was, I got the opportunity to work with a lot of clients right out of school talking with them, scheduling, budgeting, um, working with them on planting designs and additions and other materials they wanted to keep the design intent on their property. And I also delved into a lot of plant health care, lace bugs and other concerns of clients and really worked with them on how to solve that issue. Winter comes along and you really get to see the texture of all the plants and see the seasonal interest in action. And I was able to start doing container plantings and marketing those services we have with Andover Landscape and really delving into materials and estimates and design packages for them um, to be able to present to clients. I started working with a senior architect, architect there who really is great at rendering. His skills are just incredible and I've gotten to work right alongside him and kind of learn from the best especially working with the owner very closely, Russell Stott. He's super intelligent and smart, and I've kind of learned a lot about the business side of that with him. Um, so yeah, that comes with a lot of challenges and accomplishments. But I think the most important thing is discovery. I think this is a very um, repetitive topic that we're all talking about today, but it's important to not just focus on work or school, but keep discovering and keep learning because that's what makes it worth it. Um, you know, and looking at patterns for things to inspire you or just, you know, make, make your job worth doing. So thank you. If you have any questions, let me know.
So I'm going to talk about the value of construction experience as a landscape architect. And um, I'm going to give you a warning. I'm not a landscape architect, but I'm coming from construction experience with a landscape architecture degree. So who am I? Well, I have 20 plus years as a nature enthusiast, flipping over rocks and stream beds and avoiding, avoiding poison ivy in the woods. Um, and then I have three years of landscape maintenance, maintenance experience from the ages 18 to 21 and two years of landscape construction experience from the ages 22 to 24. And why are the ages important? Well, because landscape maintenance is something that you can get into at a very young age. And um, it really opens your eyes up into like how the industry functions holistically rather than just from a design perspective because there's a lot that goes into the maintenance aspects of things. And let me tell you, every landscape does require maintenance, as minimal as it may be. Um, and then, of course, I'm a UMass Amherst Landscape Architecture alumni. So the value of landscape maintenance, as I said, all landscapes require maintenance. And the way I kind of view this is there's, there's two ways of thinking about it. There's um, aspects that the designer affects as they're designing, and then there's things that affect the designer that are existing on the site um, that you have to work with or around. So what are some things that affect the designer, or the designer can affect, is the vegetation you choose, the turf, and then the irrigation. And these are just a few, but these are kind of like the main things. And these are all going to dictate the level of maintenance that your landscape is going to require. And then some aspects that affect the designer are going to be snow. And this is one thing we don't really handle much um, in the studios, but in a climate such as ours is a major factor. As you see, there's literally piles of snow outside. And if you're working in like something like a parking lot, having a place to deposit snow piles is like super valuable to a client that has a commercial place that they're going to need um, constant plowing, especially in a place like ours. Um, and then, of course, water that's going to dictate your control of erosion and such, and then invasive plants and um, pests. So invasives is going to dictate how much um, prep, work, prep work you're going to be putting into the landscape prior to even constructing or beginning the uh, construction of the landscape. And then pests is going to dictate, as you know, we have issues with the emerald ash borer, is going to dictate the type of vegetation that you're allowed to use or that you're able to um, create sustainably within the landscape. So the benefits of having an intimate relationship with these aspects, um, you get very comfortable with plant identification. You learn and you see the actual, uh, you know, the growth habits and the tendencies of the plants firsthand. Um, you learn how to care for them, how to prune them, their seasonal uh, maintenance requirements. Um, mow schedule, you know, this is something that is huge. A lot of people like turf because it's a good gathering space for um, humans. And the type of seed you use is going to dictate the water requirements, the light requirements, the, um, the schedule, how high you're going to cut it. These are all things that when, you know, your planning is easy to overlook when you're, at the, when you're just looking at it at the paper stage. Um, and then, of course, seasonal requirements, like I said, pruning, um, cleanups, things such as this, plowing, as I said, and then the labor requirements. This is another thing. Knowing what it takes, the manpower that it's going to take to complete a job, a maintenance job, um, in an efficient manner that's going to, you know, um, have the client be happy because they're not blowing all their money on, on maintenance requirements. And then so managing all these factors and, and doing it yourself really helps you have an appreciation of, of what it takes. Um, so now the value of construction experience, understanding the logistics and technical process of the construction world. Um, what do I mean by logistics? So labor requirements, as I said, understanding the manpower that you need um, to complete a project. And you know, where does, where does the advantage and the, and the cost come in when you add another person to the job? So like, you may have a machine operator and you may have a laborer working on the side. Now, are you going to get that job done any more efficiently if you add another laborer? So knowing how, how to manage these, uh, your manpower is huge. And then machinery. You can't always fit, machinery is big. You can't always fit machinery into a space where you need it. So, I mean, that can extend the, the length of a project immensely. And that's going to cost you a lot of time because labor is expensive. Um, but the knowing your machinery limits and capabilities is, is hugely important um, when you're in the when you're actually building a project. And then time frame, labor requirements and machinery. These are two aspects that play into the 
the uh, time frame aspect of the landscape construction realm. Um, managing the time frame of a project is kind of like your, like as a project from the project manager perspective of a landscape architect, that's kind of like your main role, like making sure that these jobs are done efficiently and effectively. Um, and then the transition from design to build, there's always going to be some issue that you run into. Like one example is where we were working in a someone's backyard and they had filled in their, like underneath their pool deck, like four feet, but they wanted to build a wall and plant trees behind that. And so now it's like you have four feet of concrete that you have to literally jackhammer through. And now you've added five days onto the project. That's adding cost for the client. That's adding cost for your company. And these are all things that you need to consider. So when you're, when you're transitioning from the paper into an actual three-dimensional constructed project, there's always going to be some things that you, I'm not going to say you cut corners, but there's things that you have to work with and work around to complete the job um, efficiently. Um, and then the technical process, you know, understanding, seeing, seeing something from, you know, someone's backyard and you say, wow, gee, how do I turn this into, you know, a terraced pool yard with all sorts of different bushes and, and trees and like, it's like, where do you start? So when you're working in the labor industry, it's like you see like at, on a prep crew, like you see how people start. And, and that's like one of the biggest steps because it can just be like this immense thing like in your brain, you're just like, wow, geez, where do we even begin? Um, and then you learn how to build things, which is fantastic because you know, when you're a homeowner, you're gonna be like, oh geez, I wish I knew how to build that $50,000 stone wall that I want in my yard. Ooh, I wish I knew how to put down pavement for my asphalt uh, driveway. You know, these are things that you can do yourself. They, you don't have to outsource. If you learn how to build them yourself, it's like, it's really a, a helpful thing for you. Um, and then you work across disciplines. Like I said, like we, I worked with um, all sorts of prep crews. Um, I was mainly a uh, planting install crew. And then we, so we had to work with the masons. Sometimes the masons would let their aggregate fall into our beds. And so now we're digging through also like three inches of, of crushed stone. And we're like, oh, geez, how are we going to plant these, these trees with like three foot root balls? And we're, so, you know, you, you learn how to work with uh, and kind of against the, the other um, disciplines within the industry. Um, and then those finishing touches, like as you can see here, this little harvest lane thing, like the things that... Like a tire isn't complete without that little tiny air cap that you screw on at the end, right? It kind of looks silly without it. And so it's like these little things that really like put on the bow on the project. You you see those things because you actually apply them when you're when you're doing it yourself, and like you learn the value of those things because like the lighting and all sorts of stuff like that. Like people genuinely appreciate that because it's the little things that come together that really that really make a landscape stick out. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Hey guys, uh, my name's Justin. I am a very recent graduate of UMass just last spring. Um, graduated with all these guys over here. Um, I'm today's graduate student. Um, we left UMass and went to grad school somewhere else. Um, to give you a little bit of a background, I went to Norfolk County Agricultural High School. Um, I had very few plans on going to college. I did apply to one college, though, which is the Stockbridge School of Agriculture. Um, got in and then ended up transitioning over to the landscape architecture program here. Um, all this to say, I had a very practical background um, throughout my school experience. I was never much into reading or writing um, or theory, but I decided, you know, let's challenge myself and go to the GSD in Cambridge, um, which is chocked full of all of that. Um, I did have the opportunity of doing two really awesome internships here with, for two really awesome UMass grads. Um, I worked for Stephen Lawrence Stimson over at Stimson, um, and then I worked for Dan Gordon the past couple years um, as a junior designer over there. Uh, totally different experiences. At Stimson, I was growing trees. Um, I was trying to transition into the landscape architecture program. I was, I was kind of overqualified to, to work in the field, but underqualified to work in the office. So um, it, was, it was pretty perfect for me. Um, and I really loved it. I did everything there. I, I herded cattle. I, uh, I hayed fields. Um, I did all sorts of fun stuff. And, and uh, Steve and Lauren have been great friends ever since. And then at Dan Gordon, likewise, um, I was working in there, I was working in the office, um, rendering some plans like this residence up here. Um, really awesome experience getting to learn the ins and outs of, of residential landscape architecture, which transitioned really well into my work here. 
Um, so what is it like uh, in grad school at the GSD? It's a very strange school. I get to take some really awesome theory classes. Um, for example, uh, theories of landscape as urbanism with Charles Waldheim. Really awesome stuff, really great professors um, and awesome people to be friends with. Um, as well as people like uh, Matt Cunningham teach at the GSD and teaches plants and placemaking. So just this really awesome repertoire of, of elective classes um, is, is kind of why I went to school um, at the GSD. I did, I've done two, or I'm, I've done one studio, I'm in another one, and I'm going to show you guys some examples of what we're up to. Um, there just to kind of give you an idea of what you can get yourself into um, if you go to a school like this. Um, so this is our first, our first course studio. Uh, it was a, a studio that looked into cranberry bogs um, and, and those that are at risk of saline inundation um, and uh, kind of coastal flooding. Um, it was called From Offshoring to Nearshoring Littoral Landscapes at Work. And if you're like me, um, I didn't know what littoral meant when I uh, joined the, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, so I Googled it several times. It means by water or coastal, um, in case anyone's curious. Um, it's, it gets so theoretical, and so everyone's so full of themselves. Um, anyways, so <laughs> it's a good place to be. Uh, but this is, this is our project, so we studied uh, cranberry bogs at risk um, in, in southeastern Massachusetts. Really awesome project. Got to think about um, energy flows, production, capitalism, all these weird things, um, and tried to make that um, real in the landscape. Um, and so that was kind of what we were working through there. So it's, it's this interesting mix of, of kind of heady, theoretical um, nonsense that kind of began to transition into a studio element, um, which gets kind of interesting. Um, and then this is the studio I'm in this semester. I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of a taste of um, some of the option studios there. This is called Ottawa County Remade, Toxic Transformations in the Tri-State, Lead and Zinc Districts in Oklahoma. So this is the largest, nastiest, grossest um, uh, Superfund site uh, in the whole country. It's an incredible, incredible landscape full of, of toxic waste, um, and it's and it's poisoning some of the communities nearby. Um, and so it's, it's a really awesome opportunity to study landscapes like this, work with um, some of the communities down there, and begin to kind of look at the no-nonsense um, ways to remediate a site like this. Um, some of the stuff I, I, I really uh, had, a, had a great time looking into. So this, is, um, so this is the studio I'm in this semester, just to kind of give you guys an idea. Now, I didn't put together an advice uh, slide, and I probably should have, and I'll kind of give you my advice here now. Um, if you want to go to graduate school, if you want to get an internship, if you want to really do anything outside of uh, studying here, put together your portfolio and put it together well, like right now, like tomorrow, like if you haven't, um, and, and keep working through it because it's literally the most important thing that everyone looks at, whether you're going to school, whether you're applying for a job, um, whether you do anything outside of here. So put together your portfolio, do it well, take pride in it, and really sink some time and effort into it, and it's going to pay off um, big time. So that's kind of um, my advice. Also, do, do some internships while you're here. Um, so many people will, will graduate here and, and have not worked in the field yet, um, and I think that's, that's wasted time. So do, do some internships, whether it's working in a nursery, um, anything you can do uh, in the field. Also, learn how to draw with your hands, not on a computer, OK? We're human beings. We're not supposed to be behind a computer all day, every day. So learn how to draw. Um, it's really important, and it's something that's, that's really valued in the real world, but um, people, will, people will tell you it isn't. So those are kind of my, my things of advice, and we'll, I look forward to kind of opening up to the conversation later and, and talking to you guys more about grad school. Great. <laughs> it's so wild to be back here. It feels like such a lifetime has passed. So I'm Allison. Uh, I graduated in the MLA program back in back in 2020. <laughs> um, and I'm now currently a landscape designer at Wright Ostermeyer Landscape Architects. Um, Wright Ostermeyer Landscape Architects, Wola. Um, Women-owned business, two also fellow alums from UMass, and I get to do a little bit of everything. Um, a bit of background before I landed in landscape architecture, so I got my undergrad degree in interior design uh, in 2012. I worked in interior design in the Boston area for 
about five years and figured out that interior design wasn't quite the right fit for me and the city wasn't quite the right fit for me. So I ended out in Western Mass and studied landscape. Um, and I am going to offer some tips uh, for students now for uh, how to prepare yourself for looking for a job as you near graduation. This I thought long and hard about this. I thought, like, how did I get a job that I really love? <laughs> Um, and research. So like I just said, uh, figure out where you want to live. Think about like where you might want to relocate to. For me, I knew I wanted to stay in Western Massachusetts, so uh, I um, kind of had my eye on a couple of firms that were around here. Uh, networking is probably like one of the biggest things that helped me as a student when I was transitioning into a working professional. Build relationships with your faculty members. Uh, build relationships with visiting adjuncts. Attend the Zuby lectures. Introduce yourself. Um, sometimes we have some great guests at uh, the studio critiques. Like introduce yourself and get your start having conversations with people, asking them about what they do and how they got to where they are in their career. Um, ask as many questions as you can while you're a student because it can really help um, inform you on what direction you might want to go. Um, get your name out there. So I, every year I applied for a scholarship, a student award. Um, I did independent studies and the timing worked out really well for me. So Emily Wright, um, my uh, boss that I work with now, was also an adjunct faculty member while I was a student. So I was a student with her, I was a teaching assistant with her, and I invited her to do an independent study with me my senior year. There was a scholarship through the LAF Landscape Architecture Foundation that I was really interested in, so I crafted an independent study so that I could work with her, build a relationship with her, demonstrate my skills to her, show her what I would be like if I presented to a client, and it really paid off. <laughs> it was one of my favorite things that I did while I was a student. So take advantage of, of building your network. Um, gain related experience internships, I totally agree. Get out there and get some experience, whether you're working in the office doing design or getting your hands duty, dirty, <laughs> uh, doing gardening or in installation, or like I said, independent study is another great opportunity um, to start building some practicing skills. Uh, and start your portfolio now, if you haven't. <laughs> and make it something that's a work in progress. Each semester, add a little bit more to it. I know there are job fairs every semester, Bring a draft. Um, talk to folks at the job fair. Um, I know for me personally, my spring semester, before as I was graduating, I had three internships within like the first six weeks of that semester. So my portfolio was well done before that class barely even started. <laughs> so get it done soon. And I will pause to say that is if you are aggressively looking to get a job right away. I thought Hannah gave some really good advice about taking a break. I did that when I was an undergrad too. When I first graduated with my bachelor degree, I took a summer off, I went on a road trip, it was awesome, took some space to breathe, <laughs> and then found my way into design. But as a graduate student, I needed a job. So I got started early. <laughs> um, employable skills are really important to show in your portfolio. Uh, Adobe, AutoCAD, Adobe AutoCAD, rendering software, JS, I use all of those programs regularly, all the time. So the time that you spend here, getting to know them and getting getting comfortable in those programs is really, really well worth it. Um, and communication, demonstrating to a potential employer that you have your, your writing skills are professional in both your emails and in your portfolio language, your verbal presentation style, your graphic presentation style, and hand drawing um, is also just as critical as some of those digital skills because Design thinking really comes from the hand, and then design representation is a little more digital. So I'm going to show some examples of work that I've been working on and um, hopefully share some insights. So uh, branching off of hand, hand drawing, um, we always do a hybrid at WOLA. So concept designs are always starting by hand. Large pieces of trace all over the, all over the place, markers, cr like whatever, crayons. Did you just hear me say crayons? I meant <laughs> colored pencils. Um, and then, you know, as the design refines, we'll bring it in, we'll scan it, snap it, bring it into Photoshop, add a little bit of color, and uh, we've got our first concept plan. And then as that design develops, we bring it into AutoCAD and hardline it, and the design starts to take a little more refined look. Um, also, in the field in construction, problem solving. We'll take photos of something, bring it back to the lab, he's like, hey, what are we going to do here? We didn't expect we were going to need a step. What do we do? And sketch some ideas on top of it. Um, you, 
you'd be, we, we hand draw all the time. Do it, do it, do it. Um, some things that I struggled with on my, when I first started my job was grading, <laughs> materials, and planting design. And it's not that, you know, we, we, you do that as a student, you get to know it, but I didn't quite feel confident in any of those skills yet. I like, I understood them conceptually as something that landscape designers do, but when you're actually trying to figure out how to make this design come to life, um, the best thing you could do now is um, pay attention to your surroundings. Like these are just photos I've snapped of plants, uh, materials, things, visit designed landscapes, or go to some, if you see a plant in someone's garden that you like, take a picture of it. Pay attention to the seasons, pay attention to winter and fall. Um, just like collect some inspiration images from your real, real life experience. I do spend a lot of time uh, Google images searching all the time for project inspiration, but it's great every once in a while you can throw a photo in there from your own experience, something you've noticed. You will spend a lot of time uh, doing construction documents. This summer I got to see one of my first projects come to life, which was really exciting. And the documents will all start to make more sense once you see it going up in the field. And we visit the site every week, see the progress, lots of troubleshooting and problem solving. And these photos on the left are the, the finished product. Um, you'll learn all about that in your first job, but get comfortable in AutoCAD and um, that, that learning curve will be a little smoother for you. You'll learn to coordinate with architects and consultants and engineers, and that's one thing that I've really, really enjoyed um, in my job so far, especially having a background in architecture and interior design. Architects are mostly using Revit, <laughs> and so it's great to be able to digitally model a landscape um, that is compatible with the, pro the softwares that they're using. So I used my background in Revit from my previous experience to create <laughs> what starts off as a crude model um, to something like this, and this was done in Lumion. I love doing renderings. And whew, I guess that's it. Um, and we'll go to the panel later. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I didn't really know what I was supposed to do when I was supposed to present on, and so everyone who has gone before me has, you know, uh, given some really great advice. Uh, I mean, I don't even have, like, a, a background. But, uh, so, I guess my background, I briefly studied architecture, and then I got a Bachelor's of Urban Studies and Planning, and then I did my Master's of Landscape Architecture here. Um, and so, I guess, you know, this is a picture. I couldn't actually find a picture that I took, so whatever. But, like, uh, six months makes a very big difference. You know, you're in, the, you're in the design building, and then six months later, you're at your spot in the office. And it's just a very exciting process to be able to go through. Um, and so, yeah, let's get into it. It's very, very simple. So enjoy that. So basically, you can't escape CAD. Uh, I tried to for such a long time in this program. And like I, I was like, oh, I can cheat myself out of CAD, but you can't. And so like every single day, I use CAD every single day. And um, CAD, um, uh, Adobe InDesign, uh, the programs that like you try to avoid so hard you're going to be using them every single day. So I would suggest, you know, there's like, well, like okay, wait, never mind. I'm going to go back. Okay. <laughs> so, so over the summer, I, uh, you know, I, I also felt like taking some time off. So I, you know, didn't immediately go into the, the job search. Uh, I spent, I think, six months working on my portfolio. <laughs> my portfolio was finished in August. And so I applied to, uh, I think, like 27 firms all around the country. And I uh, ended up in Boston at Brown Richardson Row in the financial district. And so, you know, a lot of people, and I guess some people would probably be surprised, but like, I love the interview process. Don't, don't be stressed out by that. You can be completely yourself. You have to be completely authentic with that. So, you know, get them laughing, get them, that's what I did. It was basically <laughs> an hour of laughing and I got a job, so it worked. <laughs> and so, so yeah, so um, you can't escape CAD, number one, you know, get really good at your programs. Uh, the, there's like things that you don't do in school that, um, 
like xrefs and external referencing and attaching all of that stuff you figure out how to do that before you start your job because that will save you a lot of time um uh the programs like i said in design all of that stuff just be comfortable with it uh two you're much more capable than you think you are um for like my entire undergrad experience all of grad school i had like severe uh imposter syndrome and i still have it at the office and like, you know, you, you spend three years or two years, however long, the under, or four years, four years for some of you, you spend a long time uh, working on this stuff. And like, you go into the job and you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm like, of course you do, because you've spent such a long time preparing for it. So like, put that uh, voice that tells you that you can't do things to the back of your mind because it's lying to you. Uh, you're all uh, like incredibly, uh, you know, uh, able to do whatever you, it is that you set your mind to. Um, so like, just go out there and do it. Uh, three, uh, maintain an open mind and stay authentically you. Um, a lot of us, you know, when we're applying to firms, we want to apply to the big names and you know the places that everyone else is applying to because that's cool. Like, who wouldn't want to work at a place like that? But like. You know, you have to really find a place that's a good fit for you. And so in order to find a place that's a good fit for you, you have to sort of think about yourself as a creative and as a designer. And what are your values? What are your values at a firm? You know, what is something that's important to you? And so, you know, apply to places that have those values. Don't just apply to places, like, I mean, apply everywhere, because <laughs> might as well. But don't just apply <laughs> to the places that, you know, they don't really meet your values, but like you, you know, everyone says that you should be working there. Because uh, you're just going to end up being, you know, stressed and sad and depressed. And like, who wants to, who wants to like put that on themselves? Um, the fourth is, yeah, you never know where you'll end up and you don't have to accept the first offer that you get, which I mean, it's like, I accepted the first offer that I got. <laughs> but um, like, you know, Think about it. It's good advice, you know. Um, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, like that goes with uh, being open-minded. You never know where you're going to end up. Uh, and I'm like very foggy at the moment. Um, yeah, it's just, this is really self-explanatory. I can't explain it. Okay, and then number five, uh, never stop exploring and creating and have fun with whatever, whatever you decide to do. Um, like, uh, there's some people, you know, you graduate and you're like, I have to have a job. And then there's other people like me, uh, and you're like, I need to take a break because I've been in school for, I don't know, 26 years. And so uh, school is all I know. So, you know, before you have your job, maybe you like take a little bit of time. It doesn't have to be six months, even though that's what I wanted to do. And then the pandemic happened and it was only like three months, but, um, you know, take whatever time you can do, um, uh, explore whatever it is that you think you're interested in in school. Like, I mean, I took a couple of classes in the art history department that I loved, because I mean, I love art, and, sorry. And um, so like, you know, just like, don't just like go through and do what's expected of you. Like you have to push, you have to push yourself to like, you know, push the expectations and the boundaries because, you know, you're never gonna, oh, that sounds so bad, okay. You're, you're never gonna, you know, like, really be able to, uh, uh, this is, uh, I have too many uh, thoughts. Uh, you're never gonna be able to, uh, you know what? Let me, let me start over again, five. <laughs> Never stop exploring and creating. Keep having fun with whatever you decide to do. Um, I'm just going to say that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, this is trying to be very deep. And I, I whatever. Um, I, let's just say that my time outside of school has been pretty great. Uh, I mean, I loved my time at uh, in, the, in LARP. I loved my time at UMass. Uh, I, you know, you kind of like, I'd say like, like the, the start of my last semester, so you know, spring 2021, 
I had all these thoughts where like, oh, I'm going into a firm and I, I'm not going to know how to do any of this stuff. But like, all of that is, you know, not true. You're going to learn, you work, and you learn as you're working. So every single day, you, the, the firm, whatever, wherever you end up, will kind of like push these things on you. And you will, you know, no matter what they are, you're going to figure out a way. <laughs> Ugh. You're going to figure out a way, you know, through all of the issues that you face. And, you know, that's part of the process. Never stop exploring and just kind of be the best you can be. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> if you don't know me already, my name is Hunter Pru. I graduated in the class of 2020 through the BSLA program. Uh, you probably recognize me from the immense amount of emails I send out to everyone in the department. Um, the title of my talk is A Learning Journey because it is literally a journey. Uh, I have this image up here. Uh, it's a bit of a dated image. Um, you, you can really tell that the pandemic really does a lot to someone. Um, but this is, all, this is where it all started. Um, so in, uh, it was junior year, fall semester. I was in a studio class with Carolina. Hi, Carolina. Um, and she provided the assignment to make a site documentary. And so this is a thumbnail from my documentary. I was like, this seems really fun. I'm going to put a lot of effort into this. So I, I did my thing, and it actually ended up really well. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to show videos, but this is how it is. So the reception was warm. I think everyone in class decided, I don't think he's going to be a landscape architect. I think he knows what he wants to do. And so that was essentially like kind of my calling. And so I did it again in Frank's studio in Springfield. And then I did it again in uh, Ethan and Theo's senior capstone when we were doing work in Boston. Um, the story behind like getting that is a whole other thing. Don't have enough time for it, but it is a time. <laughs> so um, I'm going through this program. I'm kind of understanding like this is where my skill sets are. This is where my passions are. And then, uh oh, pandemic happens. So everything is shutting down. What do I do now? I'm like, well, I'm. I'm getting my degree in landscape architecture, and I don't really want to pursue anything in the field, really. And so I'm like, you know what? What's two more years? So I decide to look at my options, and I was looking into grad school. Um, and it just so happened over in the College of Education, there is a Master's of Education program with um, a focus in learning media and technology. And I'm like, this seems nice. I mean, I was already doing um, like visual storytelling and educational media, so I'm like, I think this is a good fit. And so in order to actually go to grad school, you need money. And as a college student who, first generation, I didn't have a lot of resources to pay for my school. I'm like, I'm going to have to pay for this entire thing out of pocket. So I was working at my local garden center um, when everything crashed. Um, they were an essential business because they sold vegetable seeds, uh, fun fact. And so I racked up my hours. I was working part-time 20 hours, and then I pushed that up to 50. Um, and so when they started cutting my hours, I'm like, okay, I need to find another way. I need to pay for this. So I look around, and I see this Chinese restaurant that is local to where I live. And I see on their sign, delivery. It's a big red arrow. Um, so that is essentially what I did. I got in my little, my little red car. And of course, this was when gas was under $2. Do you remember that? And then um, also, like, I'm from the North Shore. And if, if you know anything about driving in the North Shore, it sucks. It's absolutely terrible. Someone, someone needs to get into that, like, urban planning job. I, something needs to happen there. But uh, there's, if there's one thing I could say about this, um, this delivery job, was that it paid really well. I was making upwards to 50 bucks an hour um, working this job. And um, that allowed me to move out of my parents' place. Um, so I moved to the area, and then I started paying for school. Now, online school, woo, we all know it. Um, here's the classes that I took. Uh, if you look, you see a lot of the same words. We have technology, learning, teaching, and so, 
like that is a lot of like the classes my program was doing. And there was a lot of like hands-on elements within my program too. So educational video production, educational web design, designing digital media and teaching. So I was, uh, I was using a lot of the skills that I learned from the bachelor's program, applying it to what I already knew and was developing projects out of that. So to showcase some of the things that I did, uh, it allowed me to exercise my educational video production. So rather than doing site um, analyses and like historical context, I was I did a video about um, social distancing and the and how politicized it has gotten over the years. And so it was kind of a um, it was a rendition of like observing how people were taking mask mandates. And this was back in fall 2020 when things were like way up there and. Starting that, I did a um, I did a series. Um, one of the, like some of the assignments involved like oh do a TED talk where you talk about specific subjects. So I made a series called TEDx at home because it's always location based, and uh, I got my buddy that's Ken. There's, there's something about the um, the College of Education is that your classmates are very different backgrounds. Like Ken here, he got his PhD in medieval studies. He's a master fencer, like. Weird guy, but no, he was great. Um, and so he was giving a talk about online privacy in for children, and you know, it's great. Um, and then of course, that's a recognizable scene. I actually talked about the design building in my uh, making and makerspaces class. I used it as a showcase as like this is essentially a makerspace in on UMass's campus. A lot of the hands-on learning that occurs um, within the program uh, is utilized in this space, so on and so forth. And then there are many other forms of instructional design. Uh, I developed some podcasts. Uh, I did web development through that. I developed an e-portfolio that showcased a lot of the projects that I did within the program, as well as other things I've worked on prior. Um, and even with web development, that is essentially where my thesis was built off of. Uh, I did my thesis on um, self-reflection and the articulation of thought and how it can improve the human psyche. And then I also did a part two where essentially like how to build a um, digital like program and platform to get others engaged and to provide a context where folks can self-reflect and uh, articulate. Many other things, uh, I developed eBooks, um, one being a waste management um, kind of like info book um, through UMass Amherst. I worked with someone over in the sustainability um, department and we developed this whole interactive ebook. It was fantastic. Uh, basic infographs that went over um, some of the theories that I've learned. Uh, I took like my hand drawing skills that I've learned from the department and I've, I like 2D animation. I like draw a lot of characters. Uh, I've drawn graphic novels in the past. So I use that skill to essentially visually tell a story on how, for example, um, like the race to online teaching and the struggles that come above that. I've also provided visual narratives. So in the corner there, there my professor had two chihuahuas and she loved them. Every time we had class, she would dress them up and like show them on camera. It was, it was a little weird. Um, but I essentially told her, I'm like, hey, send me a send me just a file of like all your dog pictures. And I took them, I photoshopped them and put them in situations that explained everything about like online tools uh, when it comes to like privacy, cost, uh, effectiveness and learning, et cetera. And then I also learned how to develop academic materials. This arranges anything from philosophy statements, um, syllabi, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. there was a, an assignment that involved like lesson planning with hands-on activities as well as digital ones. In the corner, I actually designed a 15-week, uh, six-credit studio, uh, landscape design studio, um, where I essentially looked at all the syllabi that I've gathered for my time being in the program. I'm like, you know what? I can do this. And so I put it together and applied my own like academic psychology to it. So. In order for all these program, all these like development tools and like all these assignments I did, there were lots and lots and lots of academic theory and principles of design I had to go through. So anything from Bloom's taxonomy, basic adult learning theory, uh, ungrading policy, which is really cool. Um, 
Kappa, pedagogy, all that stuff. Long story short, I read a lot of books and articles about this, about these topics, and uh, I'm not much of a reader. I'm like a first generation student. I grew up in a military family, and so like this was like zero to a hundred uh, in a way. So you might be thinking like, oh, how how did you get into the position that you're in now? So I'm applying to a lot of jobs, and Ken, who I mentioned earlier. One day he sent me a job application for the position that I'm in now. And he's like, this really seems like the field that you're in. But like, it has like your background. I'm like, that is my background, Ken. I, I, I might as well like, I sh shoot my shot, see where it ends up. And then one day, this was like during the summer. One day I was at a breakfast place with my partner and I get a call, unrecognized number. It was from the area. I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm getting a call. And she's like, oh, pick it up, pick it up. I pick it up and it's, Terry Trudeau, who's sitting in the back corner there, letting me know, like, oh, uh, hey, how's it going? Do you remember me? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we'd like to bring you in for a job interview. And I don't think a lot of folks have seen a grown man cry in, the, uh, in that breakfast place, but that day they did. So I've been working here since the fall semester. It's been super busy. Um, a lot of technology things, uh, communications, it's just, it's all like, whew, from what I remember back when I was in the program. But while I'm here, I'd like to, I'd like to be a face for the program and be able to talk to students, get into the classrooms, interact with them, um, teach them a lesson or two, even if it's like, oh, how do I make a PDF again? I got you. And so, like, I just want to, be there and then provide like a teaching lesson for everyone. Oh shoot, that was supposed to be hidden. Oh, Terry's still there, uh-oh. Um, so, of course, later down the road, um, I'd like to expand my horizons with everything that I've learned up to this point and what I'm gonna continue to learn. Uh, I'd like to find opportunities to teach adjunct or be a part of adult learning-based workshops. Um, this ranges from anything from digital media design, instructional learning, uh, even landscape architecture. And um, I'd just like to see um, if there was like, any opportunities for that. Um, back when I was doing part-time jobs, um, I really enjoyed it. Just spending some time working at a place, being able to learn everything that I need to learn within that place, and then moving on to the next thing, and so on and so forth. It's not fiscally friendly, um, is something that I realized, but it's a really cool experience. And maybe sometime very late down the road, I'd like to experience that again. And I write social work uh, with a question mark because like, I want my work to be extremely social. And I'm glad that I can be in this position now and have conversations with all of the instructors and students that are a part of this program. Um, of course, like, I don't want that to just be my job. Uh, just talking to people. I'd like to be there and teach and just be in that position. And so on a final note, I kind of want to bring a small piece of advice for, the, for mostly the students is um, you must understand that being in this room today is a grand opportunity, almost a privilege in a way. Um, college, um, with college, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to get to a lot of folks. There's a lot of financial barriers, um, like academic barriers. It's not easy to be here. So for the folks that are here, I, I want everyone to be able to appreciate the position you're in. You're in a program that is really close-knit. You have all these instructors that are wonderful and are willing to teach. There's not a single person here that seems like they're just here for a paycheck, which is wonderful. And, um, but essentially, just to narrow it down, enjoy your time at LARP. Um, you're only here for so long. Um, make connections, make friends, have conversations with everyone. I think all the advice that our previous alumni gave has been fantastic. And I would encourage everyone to have conversations with them and get connected. So thank you.